Hello, and welcome to Democracy in Fiction, where we talk about the ways democracy interacts with fictional universes and pop culture. I'm Mika, I use they them pronouns, and my favorite cryptids are anything that could have been an eel, but or like an oarfish, and someone was like, yo, that should be like, that. this is like 50 miles long, this is just so big, I've never seen something this large and it's in the water. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katie. I use she, her pronouns, and my favorite cryptid is the Mothman. Hi, I'm Tommy. I use he, him pronouns, and I like the Kraken. So, related to our favorite cryptids, we're talking about Monsters, Inc. today. So, Monsters, Inc. is a Disney Pixar movie that came out in 2001 and focuses on two monsters, James P. Sullivan, Sully, and Mike Lazowski, Mike. They work for Monsters, Incorporated as a team to scare children and then use those screams to power Monstropolis. Throughout their workday at Monsters, Inc., they go through doors to enter children's rooms, and all the monsters think that if a child touches them, they will die, and are very careful to not let children back through the doors into the factory, or else there would be an outbreak. So, Monsters, Inc. is an energy company in the Monsters, Inc. universe, specifically located in the city of Monstropolis, but we're, we, don't, we don't learn if there are other energy companies powering other parts of the monster nation or monster planet. Therefore, it's kind of established that Monsters, Inc. has, like, a monopoly over the entire energy industry, and it's kind of expressed throughout the film that if this company were to go down, everyone would lose power in on Monstropolis. So that's kind of a big deal in terms of large corporations ruling over a lot of everyday life. Yeah, and in addition to that, there's currently a scream shortage, and so there are illegal things happening inside of Monsters, Inc., as shown throughout the film, where they are, like, torturing children to try to get more power, which is against the law or whatever moral code they follow, but they, like, the government doesn't intervene and says, hey, you shouldn't be doing this because it is such a big company that they need, like, more evidence before they can try to take them down. Yeah, it's kind of- the only government branch that we really see is the one at the end, which is the one that's, like, taking care of, like, oh man, there has been a child that has gotten on the loose. Like, that. that's kind of all, all the government of, that we see. Um, we know that there's, like, a law, kind of, or moral or company code against, like, make friends with a child because that leads to banishment, which is they send you through a door to, if you're anything like um, Sully or Mike or Abominable Snowman, Yeti, Mr. Dude, you get sent to approximately Nepal, which turns out to not be a very effective banishment because you are pretty close to a village. You're just not expected to come back through any of the doors as you is seen in the movie. It's it's not well, very effective, man. <laughs> one of the distinctions is that, like, the company was trying to cover up them finding out about all the illegal stuff, so, like, Mr. Waterneys and Randall just shoved them through the door and forced them There was no out. trial. This there was, was not no trial. ethical banishment. <laughs> but the Yeti that they met when they were banished in Nepal never seemed to want to get back and was like, oh yeah, there is a village down there that you could use, but it doesn't appear that the Yeti has ever tried to get back. The Yeti is simply so, vibing. He doesn't need to go back. Yeah, so it seems like there's some form of trial in which the Yeti knows that no one would allow him to come back and live normally in society, and that is the larger... I guess I didn't think about that. I was just sort of like, well, if, if they push you through a door, you can come back through other doors. It's a very honors-based criminal justice system, I guess. I mean, if, if I was committing big crimes in Monster City of, like, I'm, like, I don't know, scooping out some children through this door and that's the whole thing, and I decide I want to come back and continue my life of crime, they, it doesn't seem like they have any policies in place to stop me. Yeah, we, we only watched the first Monsters, Inc. movie in preparation for recording this episode, but there is a second one that is a prequel, and I don't remember exactly what happens, but I feel like there are monster police. I feel like there are monster cops. 
Which implies that there is a criminal justice and legal system in place. I could be wrong about that, though. I only remember some vague things from the second movie. I wonder what monster crime is like. <laughs> Other than building machine to extract scares from children. Scream from children who are scared. But it's not just because there's a giant machine that's attached to their mouth. It's because you're manually vacuuming the screams right out of the person and color bleaching them a bit, as happens to... Uh, One of the monster guys. Isn't his name like Fungus or something? Yeah, his name is Fungus. <laughs> that's Love it. true. Uh, fungus. You kind of get like so a few peeks into Monster Society through some of the world building and the actions that Mike and Sully take. Things like using odorizers instead of like deodorant to like make themselves smell bad and things like that, implying that there are some cultural societal differences from human society. So what do they perceive as crime? What is monster crime? We just don't know. Well, like, sheltering a child is a crime as far as we know. And that's kind of it. Human well, children are... It's unclear if it's... Okay, it probably is a crime because they all think that children would kill them. So it might not be stated in law, but it is definitely looked down upon by society. I mean, there is kind of... We talked about this a bit before filming this episode of, like, children being possible parallel to nuclear power. This is, like, me just grabbing, like, a extruded rod of uranium and hiding it in my basement. I think like, that is also illegal. Yeah, but, like, it's a crime that is hurting me as much as it's hurting everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is actually similar to nuclear power in which they need this power source. They don't really have alternative power sources as far as we know about, and they are extremely afraid of what they're using to get energy. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess the, like, other, like, comparable alternative here is, like, probably, like, coal, but, like, since dinosaurs kind of count as monsters, I figure there's probably not as much, like, evolution going on there. Like, this is just straight up someone's grandpa you're unburying and then using as a fuel source. Like, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also kind of interesting. It does have some, like, similarities to solar, as far as I can tell, because they... All of them seem to work nine to five, and none of there's no overtime. Nobody works after that because there are some scenes when they're trying to like get Boo back through the door where they're like sneaking around and there's no one else in like the building that you see, and so like solar. One of the major issues is that you have to try and store it for peak usage hours, which are like in the evening when everyone is watching TV, but you get the most sun in the middle of the day. However, it's not exactly similar because it seems like they can store screams really easily slash maybe indefinitely without any decrease in like value. I was going to say, I'm surprised they haven't developed solar in the monster universe, because they do have a sun. It's not like they live in a world with no sun. I'm, su I'm kind of surprised that they haven't come up with other energy alternatives um, until the end of the movie when they learn of a more efficient power source in uh, children's laughter instead of screams. Yeah, laughter is shown to be just ridiculously more powerful. Um, doesn't even really need to be processed or hooked up to anything. Boo laughing just straight up powers all of the doors in a room. That's... Yeah, it like powers all of the doors in the factory and also in a separate instance powers and subsequently shuts down because of overload an entire apartment building. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if we're using our, our nuclear energy parallel, this is... We know that fusion would hypothetically probably be cleaner and wouldn't leave around massive amounts of waste. But also it's like, well, the conditions for fusion, what is that? Is that's that's the sun. That's stars. We can't exactly make the the atoms laugh <laughs> by telling them funny jokes, which I think would be the epitome of a job for me. Um. Yeah, I also feel like it's interesting because they didn't know anything about how powerful laughter was, but the the whole illegal thing they were doing was they were going to suck screams out of children with this, like, big machine, but it really seems like it, it effectively is a one-time use per child, I'm pretty sure, 
because they don't look so great after. And so it's just, it's not sustainable over time because you will run out of children while, like, their current system, they can just continuously use children until they grow up. An assumption is that there will always be children around, but that's not really something that they worry about in the movie. Getting back to government bodies and entities in Monsters, Inc., the privatization of the energy sector monsters inc is the only company and it is a private company it's expressed in the movie the what's his name water moose water noose water noose oh he says that this is a family company and he's like the third generation ceo of the company and they have a huge monopoly over the entire energy sector essentially which is something that in theory is not a thing in our democratic American society, asterisks, asterisks, asterisks. It's also, they have this monopoly over the energy sector, but there is still a screen shortage, and so it's not clear... Could they you obvi- a second company? What would yeah. happen? What would happen if you had another company? Because they have a ton of doors, and I feel like they are probably using all of the children. Well, it's like, who's in charge of door tech, I'd say? The, the real kind of, if we follow this upstream a bit more, where... Where do the doors come from? Yeah, who's manufacturing these doors? Is every time a human world door created, does Monster World also get a door? Are these only closet doors? No, they aren't, because they show... Some doors would just show up in the middle of nowhere. Oh, you're right. Was it only the one that showed up in the middle of nowhere? Maybe that is Monster because Banishment think, doors. Yeah, the Monster Banishment door was markedly different in design and may have been manufactured by monsters taken into the human world on an extremely dangerous journey and then put in that spot specifically for banishment. So that does so imply are like the monsters some... making the closet doors and putting the closet doors in place or I don't are... think so. Is all door manufacturing in the human world <laughs> done by monsters? Huh. I mean, I don't know who makes doors. But your point of, okay, so door following the pattern upstream, manufacturing the doors, it's really the shortage of doors that would be causing the monopoly. You could, in theory, have a second power company, but they would still need access to doors and children in the, in the human world. So is there a shortage of children? Is that the problem here? Well... Not necessarily on this topic, backing up a little bit, we do know in, like, near the end of the movie that the one government organization, which I can't remember what it's called, but it's the one that deals- CDA. Yeah, CDA. Deals with the children. They have the power to destroy doors. This is seen when they're like, hey, we can send Boo back and then we're gonna have to destroy the door. The company has the power to destroy the doors. That's what the two janitor monsters are doing, is they- move around that machine and whenever there's something like bad that happens in a door mm-hmm. where it's it. like a really bad child or something that you could not get screams from then they shred the door and never use it again possibly this could be a company created deficiency in order to drive up the cost of screams yeah no that's what i was thinking because it's like the scream shortage is such a weird situation to be in considering that they could just make more doors because I assume that they don't if they're working like nine to five and they pop in to like each child's room perhaps they're using as many children as possible can a monster not scream monster screams don't appear to power anything because okay. there are multiple well, they times they power them less right significantly less because that's if they power them at all it is not shown because when monsters scare each other throughout the movie they don't cause like energy pulses like boo does when boo is yeah what happened when they extracted the screams from fungus or whatever it was not was? shown you oh, couldn't see shown. the levels mm. yeah interesting yeah so wrapping back around to government so there's the child detection agency the cda which almost immediately intervenes whenever there is a possible human contact Like, when one of the monsters has a sock on his back, immediately they call for the CDA with this giant red button they have on the factory floor. 
and they come parachuting through the windows and like ex they put the sock in this bomb shelter and blow it up and so it's unclear where the belief of humans will immediately kill you if they touch you came from because the CDA is taking immediate drastic action and like shutting down the factory one of the quotes from Water News was that an entire scare floor was out of commission because this happened. And so the company is not a fan of this regulation. And Mr. Water News doesn't seem to view it as necessary. He also does turn around pretty quick when Sully is like, hey, this human child won't kill you. I'm sorry that she's like climbing on your leg. Um, I, I have the sneaking suspicion that water noose knows somehow and this is just because i don't trust companies in general but monsters inc is not exempt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and something else we see with the cda is that Roz, the secretary slash file clerk in at monsters inc is actually an undercover agent from the cda who's been essentially running a sting operation at monsters inc to expose their their illegal action so there is precedent for the government intervening in the private sector in these cases of suspected illegal activity, implying once again that there is a justice system and criminal charges that could be held up against this company. Oh yeah, and the CDA does take away water news. Are they the police? They do take away water news, but it's hmm interesting. Yeah, they are is the only crime in the monster world children related? It's never mentioned what, like, Bigfoot and the Yeti have done. Well, it's implied that it's because they made friends with a child, I think. Oh, is it? Is it? I didn't there's, get There's that. one part where someone, or I think, like, Mike was talking about, like, we're gonna get banished, like, what happened to Bigfoot, what happened to the Yeti, all those things. Like, if you become friends with a child, you get banished. Oh, all I the guess... cryptids are monsters from the monster world, I missed that part. Yeah. Mothman? Yeah. Mothman what did was Mothman your bro. Do? <laughs> Mothman did tax evasion. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the government only comes in when there is like an extremely necessary situation. Like the scream shortage, the government doesn't appear to do anything about the scream shortage, even though that is definitely detrimental to society and is just leaving it up to the company. But something like a human outbreak where it would kill multiple monsters, or at least that's what they think it would do, um, then they intervene and make sure that it doesn't happen. Seems like they think it's some sort of, like, human cooties, almost. Like, anything a human touches, a monster can't touch. Like, it's it's not even really germ theory, because I don't know, like, are germs in the monster world? Are they also monsters? How far does the monstering go? Wait, yeah, do we ever see, like, pets in the monster world? I'm trying to remember. I think the closest thing you get is the secretary, the, like, Medusa secretary oh, snakes. Snake but hair. those are, like, attached to her. So it's unclear. Uh, I don't want to get into monster philosophy of what is a monster. <laughs> but we do kind of see some things about the way monster society is structured and set up. It's set up very similarly to human society, especially in terms of infrastructure. Like, they don't do any... They have, like, a ton of different monsters, all with different needs, and they don't adapt to them at all. In the first few minutes, you see this goo creature... Slime man. Slime, slime man. Yeah, and he's just, like, strolling down the sidewalk, and then says hi to Sully as he's going, and doesn't realize that there is one of those subway grates on the sidewalk and just kind of walks over it. And then his whole body slides through it. And it's unclear. He's not dead because then he says, aw, shoot, or whatever, to be a joke. But he's just like... But what happened to this man? <laughs> like, what happened to him? Like, it seemed like it had happened to him before and it was uncomfortable and it would take a long time to fix and I assume that he could fix it, but society did not adapt at all to this person's needs of, like, maybe we shouldn't have open grates in the ground where people would just The Monsters, separate. Inc. infrastructure is ableist. 
Inherently so. There's also Mike Wazowski consistently getting things put over his face because he's so small. Mike Wazowski experienced microaggression? I don't like it. It's not good on the me. Does Mike wear glasses at any point in the movie? I don't think so. Maybe it's in a different movie. Maybe it's in the second one, I think, or something. But Mike Wazowski is specifically a cyclops. And there are other characters who have different number of numbers of eyes. And for some reason, I do recall at some point someone needing glasses and then putting a different number of lenses on it. So it does show that some elements of society have been able to adapt to these different monster uh, body needs. But, but that's, they that's, haven't changed infrastructure. That's adaptation on, like, individual level. I suppose so. Yeah. There's also, like, the the suits for the, um, the, what is it, the, the CDA. CDA. Um, the suits are, like, hazmat suits, but they are developed for different body types. Um, and you can kind of see the outlines of various sort of monsters that have, like, eye stalks or whatnot. They have suits that are tailored to them. The government knows and is willing to make it up. <laughs> I guess... There's one of the monsters on the factory floor who's not a scarer, but is the partner, I guess? Like, they have a bunch of eye stalks, and each eye stalk has a different hard hat. That is and true. So they have they have some safety regulations. It's unclear what would fall on them. I guess it would be if there was a door malfunction, or if someone got in the way of a door, like, moving into place. But it's also kind of interesting that the scarers are the more prestigious job. They have a leaderboard and get all of the fame. And so the partner monsters don't really get anything. Like Mike Wazowski is super supportive of Sully. Like, oh, you're doing so great. You're gonna be top scarer today and all that. The blue collar worker who gets nothing for the work of... (laughs) S- such scarer makes the dollar fate. supporter makes a dime <laughs> <laughs> non-customer facing interactions sully has a lot of fame and can get things with it in addition to just being famous that's right this this is a company they work at an energy plant essentially but they have some sort of celebrity status in society Yeah. Within the company, it's like whenever there's a new top scarer, they like get a crowd of all the company employees around them, and it's like, oh wow, fantastic, good job. But Sully, Sully is like on TV, on magazines, out, gets pull at a super fancy restaurant to get a seat when it's really hard to get a seat. There's that part with like the new monster interns or like new employees or whatever, like, oh my god, we're so excited to meet you meaning that they've been following his career yeah. for an extended period of time. Okay, so um, to wrap up today's episode, we've got a question for you guys, which is, what do you think is the best parallel for Monsters Incorporated? Is it, is it like Hollywood, but we get energy from viewership? Is it nuclear power? Like, what's, what's exactly going on? How would this work in society? Thank you for listening, though, to us talking about monsters, companies, and politics. Feel free to um, leave a comment below. Like, subscribe if you want. I don't know, I feel annoying when I say that. Um, We love to hear from you guys. Any feedback is great. And thank you so much for watching, listening, whatever you're doing. Thanks. (laughs) And we'll see you next time on Democracy in Fiction.